just tell me a little bit about um, uh, your, your military background before coming to Canada. Um, before I came to Canada, I was part of the British military uh, artillery. Uh, I started off as a commando in 29 in my hometown, funny enough. And then I was posted off to older shots uh, in the early 80s. After that, uh, several tours with the British Army, posted out to Germany for 10 years, and several tours to Suffield before I arrived, uh, decided to move to Canada in the early 90s, in approximately 95 when I landed in Canada. So how many years of the British Army? 12. 12, 12, 12 years, yeah. That's a busy 12 years? Very busy 12 years, very. So um, tell me a bit about uh, this Afghanistan tour. What were you doing at the time? At that time, I was working for a trucking trucking company, a local trucking company, as a director uh, for a high stress job dealing with uh, British Columbia, with all the shipping, receiving truckloads in and out, uh, ships and trains. And basically, my job was to coordinate everything that happened in BC. So the BC border was my responsibility to make sure it was efficient. Talking to my sales staff making sure we were getting the contracts. So why at the time, why did you volunteer to go to Afghanistan? At the time, um, I've been training for many years, so you know I mean, this is my opportunity to give back, to actually put my training into some actual use. Yes, it's great to be training all the time in Canada or wherever we're training. However, when it came to an operation, if I'm required, then I'll go. So that was the biggest thing for me. It was one of those, I was at that, point in my life where I needed to either, as my wife would put it, midlife crisis. That was my midlife crisis at that time. So I took the opportunity and applied. Because unlike the, you know, the young guys in early 20s that have never deployed, I mean, you've got Northern Ireland under your belt, you've already done operational deployments. Yeah. So. And it's more mentoring. I felt that it's time for me to start paying, giving back to the younger guys, maybe guide them properly. Maybe they may make a silly mistake and it may cost. So it's my turn to ensure that it didn't happen. So what did your wife, your family and friends say when you told them? Uh, my wife was like, okay, yes, it's been your life. I, underst I basically understand. However, not happy about it. And like I said to her at the beginning, I'm not guaranteed until I step on that plane that I'm going. And that is the reserve world, definitely. Um, we are asked to go on these deployments, but you're competing against everybody in the country who wants to go. So she said, okay, we'll go ahead and go and do it. She supported me throughout, yes, we had a couple of rough patches through it. It's just because I've been away so much. And uh, she thought I had got it out of my system, but it was time for me to go and do something. What's your, uh, your employer at the time? My employer was very supportive of this. Um, I never had any of the issues. I used to work on, do all my weekend stuff and my Wednesday nights, literally leave my office in uniform and go off and do my reserve thing. And I actually invited them out here. They've had visits to the unit. So they had a link with us and uh, he was very supportive on it. He gave me a leave without no issues and said, you can come back as soon as you're done. Tell me about the, uh, just some details about your workup training. Um, the workup training was uh, split with the Air Force. Um, uh, we're attached uh, as I was unmanned aircraft systems. We were split with Triple Four Squadron, which was one of the squadrons that we were attached to, and four Air Defense Regiments, so those two different units. Um, we were shipped, I was basically shipped to Gagetown to start with. Uh, when I arrived in Gagetown, there was another sergeant who was supposed to have the same position, so there was a little confusion. Uh, I ended up getting that position, he got a different position. Uh, my primary job was to look after the nine reservists. Uh, the regular force guys didn't know how to, what was involved in the pay and everything else. Being the senior guy, that was my first initial task when I arrived on the ground, to bring in the nine other reservists that was going to be with us on this door to ensure they had everything they needed equipment, and then we started on our basic trainings, our qualifications for vehicles, uh, what equipment we're going to have out there, and then starting on the theories of where all our weapons, bringing us up to speed, up to the regular force standard. And 
Um, so you're working with the drones? Yes. Right? Yep. So, I mean, no one has described what that kind of workup training would be like. So what are you doing specific to that equipment? That equipment uh, was very complex, long process. It was a longer process than most people. Um, myself, I ended up going to Finland to look at l different launching systems um, because it was still fairly new to us. I mean, we received it early in 2006. Um, trialing and trials and areas. Um, the aircraft system is very complex, so we had different teams. One was launching and recovery, which I was in charge of, I was put in charge of. Then you have your refueling technical guys, and then you have all your aircraft mechanics as well. So all these people are different mixed trades. So it was actually very complex to get everybody, and our squadron was from way out in Nova Scotia, so it was very challenging sometimes to get everybody together at the same time. What kind of UAV is it? Uh, the Scanny, uh, it was Sperwer. It was uh, known as Skidoo in, in theater because of it has a Rotex engine. Mm -hmm. So it was a uh, 500cc Rotex engine, ran at 6,000 RPM. So this weighed 750 pounds. It wasn't a light machine. So we had to train guys on operating a crane to lift the aircraft on and off a launcher without damaging any of the aircraft or the launchers. So, and all the technical requirements for an aeroplane. As artillerymen, which most of us were, was a little different. Uh, definitely, we actually all learned how to repair airplanes as well, so we were there. So who's doing the actual flying? Actually, it was, uh, we had uh, pilots, captains, and artillery guys actually flying the aircraft. They actually got trained how to fly the aircraft itself out the systems. And we all actually took in turns to learn the systems all together, so, which was actually very challenging sometimes. Like, um, you got some people are adapted to that type of stuff who took to it, and then you have other people that are not so adapted. So you have to do a little bit more training with them. Uh, the Air Force definitely have different ways of doing things to the Army, but we had to get their mentality into a tactical situations. Um, so we would do exercises with them just to bring them up to our speed on certain stuff and then they would train, it was like back to front training for each of us. So you have Air Force pilots that are flying these? Yes. And because uh, I just know very little about like the physical, how it works out. So where would they be situated? If you, you launch it, where's the pilot? They're what? actually in a back of a HL truck in a sea can. Uh, actually, basically, a whole system was in the back of a C can. All the computers, uh, because it's line of sight systems, so radars would the aircraft would fly off the line of sight with plot flights. Um, the thing with this system was it had could fly 6,000 AGL, which is pretty high off the ground, and at two kilometers, still see people pretty clear. If I'm understanding correctly, you've also got to be because it's line of sight, you've got to be close, you're launching it close to the action. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and the thing is, it has, the range it has was very good because it works off aircraft height, so the aircraft's higher, so it just picks up just line of, like a normal radar would be, or telecommunication systems that you get. Okay. Like your cell phone, it works off a system, so you have a tower, which is the launch, actually the command center, and then the launchers are actually could be right next to it. The recovery part of it was a little bit different because it doesn't have any landing gear. It landed under a parachute and airbag system. So in other words, it was designed to crash. Totally to designed to crash. So can you, can you give me a sense of the, the range? Like um, we would do anything up to 60, 70 kilometers at least, at least up to 100 and something kilometers away we can fly. So we got the range, it depends on the fuel and the conditions on the range of a lot of time. Uh, anything that we, in our AOR for Canada, from Kandahar outwards, we could cover easily um, because there was more than one level of that, those systems out there. So the systems at higher levels, and we were in the lower to mid range high systems, then you have your low range UAV systems. So when you look back on the tour uh, in, in relation to your workup training, uh, how, uh, um, how effective was your workup training? It was very effective in some respects and then other respects it wasn't so good. Um, 
because of the diversity of the two types of units that you're dealing with um, and the, Air the way the Air Force and the Army do things, there was, sometimes there was no, it didn't match. So a lot of the recovery teams were mostly Army guys because we were used to being on the ground, we used to deploying. However, I used to force the Air Force guys to come with me to recover just to give them the experience. So when they go back, they'll have that experience under their belts. A couple of them didn't like it, but that's fine. But that's part of what we were there for. We were there to do a job. They were available. They're, they were going with me, so, or my 2IC, so. So, you, I mean, we mentioned before, you had the operational experience in Northern Ireland. What, um, but you haven't been to Afghanistan. What, before you went over there, what were your expectations about what it would be like? Um, from what I did as my own personal research, I knew it's going to be hot to start with. And being a redhead blonde person, I was like, oh, this is going to not be fun. However, when I actually physically hit the ground, the actual, the ground was a lot different than I expected. Uh, it was a, like where the base was and the, so close to the desert, the sand. But when I started doing, looking at the imagery, um, working with that part of it, and seeing how the farmers worked, I went, hey, that's southern Alberta. But with it, it's got a little bit more desert sitting next to it, that's all. It had the same sort of community type thing, smaller towns, farmers doing the fields. Yeah, but I mean, obviously the security part of it was, I was always a, a continent of all that stuff. What, those are your expectations. What were your, what were your hopes for the tour? Um, for the tour that, we would start achieving some stuff. I, like I said beforehand, I did do a little research. So I knew that some things were working while on my tour, we were actually able to get the dam up and running. So that was one of my highs, would I say, for that, for the tour. It was because I was able to fly when I was UAV operating. I could see our challenges working, that we got their dam, electrical power is going back to the people. And I saw other things that, you know what I mean? Houses being built, schools being built, and watching this stuff. People actually getting back to sort of normality. What we would call normality to what they call normality are two different things. Mm -hmm. I mean, understanding their culture is one of the biggest things that I actually enjoyed trying to learn from some of the locals that I had to work with. And I learned quite a bit from those guys. Was there any particular, in terms of your hopes, any particular experience that you wanted for yourself? Myself, it was obviously, um, for my personal event, it was, it was rewarding for myself that I was achieving something itself. Like, going on that tour there was going, okay, I've reached a certain milestone in my life. I've done a whole lot of different things. I want to see if I can pass something back to my guys. And I believe I did. And a few of them, I still in there. They talk to me now, and they said that was a great tour. We worked hard. We did a lot of stuff, and we actually had fun, and we actually did our jobs. That was one of the things I was my own personal aim to pass back knowledge I have. Um, when I got to pre, like back to the pre thing, um, reading all the rec, uh, the people that were going to work for me, experience-wise, not a lot of them had experience in combat situations, how to deal with the stresses, how to deal with ind people. I did Bosnia as well, or former Yugoslavia. I did uh, several other different little tours with the British armies. Um, but it was one of those little things that I thought, if I can pass at least a little bit, and some of them take the knowledge from me, I've achieved my aim as a senior guy. You mentioned that you were there to sort of help navigate some of the administrative aspects for the reservists. What were relationships like between the reservists and the reg force? At first, there was a little tension um, because they've never had to deal with this many numbers at any one time. They may have the odd one guy that they have to deal with. Um, a lot of, I, I found, we had that bad mentality of you're just a part-timer you don't really know enough. Uh, however, I found that a lot of my guys were actually more apt 
than their regular counterparts sometimes. Um, that's just, that was just one of those things that's always going to be there. It's just a thing that sits in the background. Um, but for me, being the senior guy, that was my job to ensure that the buffer between those two was smoothed out. Uh, I worked with my warrant officer and the other sergeants who've never really dealt with them. Uh, it was a little tough sometimes. Uh, say, look, this is the way, that's the way they think at the moment. We've just got to try and educate them around now to bring them in to standard. And it may take a little bit more work, that's all. But my guys were keen. They want to be there. That was the thing. This is the difference. This is one of the differences I've noticed. When a reservist applies to go on a tour, he's willing to make every sacrifice that's required. The Red Force guy, that is his job. That is his job. I've been in his shoes. That's my job. I'm going regardless what's happening. So that little mentality sits in the back of a lot of people's minds. They don't realize that the reserve guy has given up a little bit more, sometimes a little bit more, because he does his stuff on the weekends. So he's working seven days a week instead of the five days a week, where he doesn't get the stat holidays sometimes. He's taking his own personal holidays to do his trades. And I've done that. I've taken my personal holidays to do courses to be qualified. Well, last question before we take a quick break. Well, why do you think you're, some of your reserve soldiers were more apt um, than the regular force? What was it? Um, what it is is because this is a whole new, the UAV system was a whole new system to all of everybody, the reg and the reserves. Um, what I found was that a lot of my reserve guys had done research before they came over to go, okay, I'm going to be doing this job. I better learn something about this because my regular force counterparts have already been doing it. However, they didn't realize their regular force counterparts hadn't been doing it either. So technically the reserve guys took that initiative themselves to learn a little bit. Say, oh, I'm going to be doing this job. Oh, I may be doing this job. I better learn a little bit about what I'm going to be dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, on the exercise portions, it could be seen. Like I could see it when we were out in Suffield or when we went off on our other operations in Wainwright for the workup, for the bigger part, the bigger pictures, um, that some of the guys, you know, go, okay, this is another exercise. And that was the mentality where the reserve guys were like, okay, I'm here to get a job done. I'm gonna get this job done. But you have the same effect as well. They, a couple of them would slacken off once in a while. So it's just refocusing a lot of time. I'm just curious, did you go with anybody else from here? Yes, I actually did with, with one other member. She actually done one other tour. So she done her sec, this was her second tour. And she ended up being tasked with me. So it was actually good. We're still very good, she's good friends. We're very good friends. And I've known her since she joined the unit. So it's like, it was, a, we had a camaraderie. And a lot of the local guys, um, I had guys from, a couple of guys from out east, some from the west coast, from Vancouver. I had guys from Edmonton, um, all over basically. And all reservists, there was a total of about 11 reservists in total in the end. Well, we, we, were, we came under Triple Four Squadron, which is the Air Force portion of it, okay. and four Air Defense Regiment. The Ar Air Defense portion was the Army portion. So the Air Army was the Army portion, and then the Air Force obviously was Triple Four. However, Triple Four Squadron was office, a search and rescue squadron. So they were based out, out, out on the coast there, out in um, uh, Gander. So I had to go out there to do weapon training with them. So they flew me out to do weapons, to teach them how to use the weapons and stuff, before they came down to Gation. So at least when we did the actual practice route firing, at least they weren't completely lost. And it was in the middle of winter as well, so it's, it became challenging sometimes with those guys. Tell me about your, just your f first impressions once you hit the ground in Afghanistan. Um, one of the first things that happened is um, I ended up being the very first guy on the ground in Afghanistan for our flight, for our new flight. Because um, of Gagetown being snowed in, all the flights were cancelled out in Montreal in that area at that time. And I actually ended up being the very first guy on the ground. Uh, we landed in Kandahar and then uh, we were taken to the BATS, which is the big buildings where we all stayed for the first night and before we got all our briefings. 
So the first couple of days is basically you're completely lost. You're like you're being guided along by the, your predecessors, so the ones you're going to be taking over. Um, my job at that time was basically I got a message, organize everything. So I basically had to take over the job of the Sart Major and everything else until they could hit, get in get into get out, into theatre. So. So I did, I went and got my briefings, initial briefings, you get your environmental briefings, this is the things you need to worry about, water, consumption, and um, walk, I walked around the base to get to know the base a little bit, so where things were, find out where we would be positioned, or where the flight's located, and I met up with, this, at the time, the, the CO in charge of that flight, sat down and said, sir, I'm the first guy on the ground, I've been basically tasked to get things organised. He says, okay, off you go. So I met with everybody that I could meet. By the time I arrived, a lot of the guys had already left. So what was left was skeleton. So they were expecting a lot more guys to arrive. So I ended up having to go straight to work, take over a couple of the jobs that was going to be done by other people that are still to come. It was a bit of a challenge for the first, I think about the first week I was there. I didn't have anybody else to, I had to keep, they ended up keeping guys back until the flights could get in. What about your, um, just your memories of like the physical space, of the, the base? The, the space, uh, I mean, we're right by the runway. We're by a big runway. So noise levels were huge. I mean, you heard big aircraft all the time. You had it jets taken off and it gave you the sense that, and then you walk around, you see the walls, the wire, wire, and then you went, okay. I'm in an operational theatre. My head automatically went into my military mode, but even though I do think of my family all the time, but my head was into my job. Um, the space itself, I mean, it was huge. Like walking, you walked, I mean, with this new Pokemon thing that's going on, you walked as many miles as these kids, or some of these kids are walking nowadays. I mean, it felt like, um, you're in a, a major city, but you're enclosed. Tent, uh, the living quarters, yes, we were in the tents. Uh, there was other quarters like, um, and getting used to being very confined, very small space for all your own personal, personal space was a challenge sometimes. Uh, communications with the home is, you know what I mean? It was always a challenge in theater. How would you maintain comms with your family? Uh, with a lap, I had a laptop that I, I had, and I still have that laptop, funny enough, and it's still going strong, which is surprising. I mean, the dust and stuff that got into electronics was just amazing. Um, computer, most of the time, Skype was, we tried Skype for a bit, but it was very accurate, so we just email, like chat along on the emails. Most of the time, um, Photographs, once in a while we'd, we'd get photographs and stuff like that. I actually started writing letters again, which was an art form that I forgot how to do, but I ended up writing letters and sending letters out and stuff like that. Uh, wrote phone calls? Um, the wife said, it's hard for you because you, the time frames, all the time differentials, and because she's working, it was a little difficult to talk, try to tie down. So we decided that before I even left that uh, we'll just do it by the computers, do the Skype thing. We'll set up certain times, and which we did. We roughly like, okay, this is the time zone. I'd give her roughly, we worked out the time zones and we set up a time. And it may be like two o'clock in the morning for me. And it's early afternoon for these guys, for them here over here. So it's just trying, we try to make, accommodate for both of us. So, because she still had the family to look after here, so that was a big thing. So, tell me a bit about sort of your a, a typical day. What would that involve? Uh, my typical day, depending on, because we worked like the Air Force does in shifts. So we'd have I split the team. We split our teams into two, a two twelve-hour shifts. Uh, so launch crew or recovery crew, launch and recovery crew would one crew would be on from say six in the morning till six at night, or depending on. At the very beginning, it was easy to do that because we had everybody. Out. As soon as HLTA or the brakes started taking it in effect, then you lose numbers. So we had to revamp our hours. Sometimes I'd do 18 hours. 
day because my 2IC was gone or I would be covering for somebody else. So our days could vary from a nice easy eight hour, nine hour day or 18 plus hour, hour days. I did do a two day one, which was a challenge, that's for sure, trying to stay awake for two days. And uh, how many launches and where are you launching? Uh, on average, we're doing three launches a day, aircraft launches a day, and that's three times recovery. Um, the aircraft would be up as long as its fuel would allow it to, and that could vary to anything from during the daylight, daytime, you're looking at four hour flight times. Because of the heat, you only get so much fuel in an airplane. I mean, these are things that I learned while I was doing this, this job. Stuff that I wouldn't have even thought about. What it involves to do with the airplane. Um, at night, obviously, the plane could go longer because it's cooler. So the fuel, you could get more fuel on so it could fly six hours. And visibility with that camera was amazing. I mean, it was a Nikon camera. The camera alone was worth $1.2 million. Just the camera. That was without the rest of the part of it. It was an amazing camera, black and white. But the imagery that you used to get from that stuff was just amazing. Still amazes me. How many, how many of these drones did you have at the time? Uh, we had eight, eight aircraft. Okay. However, some were in for repairs. As an aircraft, it's treated like an airplane. So every so many hours, it'd have to be completely rebuilt or stuff would have to be done to it. So it's sketched a lot of it. The mechanics that we had there, we had a normal army vehicle tech to look after the army vehicles or the green fleet. And then you had about five or six guys to deal with um, the aircraft. And then you have your parachute guy, which had to be, to be a certified parachutist guy. So he had to do all the parachute stuff. It was two of those guys and that's it. So they would split, depending on how many times the aircraft went up, uh, we did have a lot of issues. The aircraft had a tendency to quit on us more than more than it should, but we figured out some of the issues and started fixing those issues as we went along. The launcher would go down, then we would work a lot harder to get that thing back on our, because as far as we're all concerned, that thing needed to be up all the time to ensure that our guys out on the ground had some sort of imagery going on for them. And I know, understand it's a higher asset, so it was a higher level asset. So it's always at the higher levels that say, right, we need this plane up. You're going to go over here. So, How, how many of these, uh, either, your, either Canada's or other nations, would be in the air at a given time? There could, uh, at any time, we could have had anything up to 20 aircraft up there. Uh, but, I mean, the size of the area that they covered, but, I mean, the... The British had theirs, the Americans had theirs, everybody had their own variations. However, they were all linked together through the headquarters. So each asset was linked together. So you had assets at high levels and all, all the way down to the guy at the very front line with a little mini one that will only do two kilometers. Just to look over the hill sort of thing. So what kinds of missions or tasks were the spurs? One of our Primary ones was roadways. We would, because it had thermal imaging, so we could tell if the ground had been disturbed. So we would tag it with a 10-figure grid, and the engineers would go follow up. So we would run the major routes a lot of the time, or if there's an, something going on, we would circle nearby and observe onto all our bases. Um, the other tasks are basically, route clearance was one of our primary jobs and then basically village and do village inspections. And I'm just, this maybe is more for me, but <laughs> are they, do they have to be actively flown the whole time or can you, can you um, program a route in? And, uh, you can actually, the thing is with this, the spur were, you had to fly it. Um, it's very much like an airplane. It was very much like, it was basically based off an airplane, Delta wing airplane and um, that had to be flown. Uh, other systems that we had later on, I ended up training on a different system because I got moved to the Americans for a while, um, for three months of my tour, uh, to help with the new system that Canada ended up buying. Mm -hmm. um, they only sent a major and a warrant officer, and so they needed extra bodies, so 
they grabbed me and said, okay, you're now doing imagery. So I spent a lot of time up in doing imagery. And that was a smaller system. So, and that could, you could just plot a route and then let it go. And it would just fly that route until you told it to come home. The nice thing about those systems were you could fly one out, work all day. When it rang, load a few, you launched the next one and they pass off and you just recover the other one. So it was basically a 24 and seven visibility could be done. Did you ever learn how to fly it? Yeah, that was, we all had to learn because of uh, the size of our flight wasn't that big. We didn't have that as many personnel. So we all had to be able to jump in everybody's seat if we had to. So what's that like? What's it like flying? It's actually um, having a radio controlled airplane. And it is just like when you see gaming systems. A lot of the stuff is based off that design. E simplicity is a lot of the things that I liked about it. I jumped in and went, okay, what do I need to do? Boom, 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 okay. And off I went. A lot of time, a lot of the flying is straight level. You're straightforward, straight, you're going to a certain point, you're gonna loop back around and have a look at this. And it was a lot of moving around, unless something came up. Obviously, if something happened and our guys were in contact, then our, we would be tasked to go and do the flight in to give them visibility. Um, with technology nowadays, I mean, the soldier on the ground is gonna be able to get this stuff. Being an artillery observer, that's really good for me to see what I'm going to be hitting. So we can get 10 figure grids where an observer is probably going to do eight. But for this, we'll give us a 10 figure, so a door if we needed to put it into a door. So accuracy for us is, was good. So one person's flying it, is the other person working the camera? Yeah. So basically you have two man team. You've got your officer and then the image guy. So a lot of us were trained mostly on image because the captains, we had enough captains. To, but when it came out that once HLTA, we're gonna be down like 50%, we went, uh-oh. So we all started doing in-theater training. Actually within, our training never really stopped throughout the whole tour until the day basically we left. Mm -hmm. So there was always something, okay, we need to learn how to do this. Oh, we got this new piece, let's add this to it. So, and we learned so much about the systems Canada became one of the leaders in the UAV world for, for the imagery portions of it as well. The recovery side of things is the aircraft, I'm, I'm assuming it's meant to come back to where it was launched? Yeah, from. correct. What was the reality? Reality is a lot of the time it would either run out fuel early or it would lose a signal. And if it loses its signal, it used to do what we called halo. In other words, it would climb up to see if it can find a signal. If it happened to pack up a wrong signal, it would fly towards that signal. And it did happen a couple of times, and they did send a jet after one of them, because it was going the wrong direction. And wouldn't have been nice. So, but it ended up coming back on itself. Um, the reality is that a lot of time they would end up either shutting for some unknown reason, would shut down. And this is, could be contributed to the dust, the dirt, the heat, and a whole other factors, a lot of factors involved. Uh, but we used to spend a lot of time going out to recover them outside of the confine of where it's supposed to land. So you were outside the wire together? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of them was in the minefield I had to go get at night. So uh, a lot of that time was done with uh, escorts, our escorts. It wasn't, I, I think I went out with the Canadian escort once. The rest of the time was the Royal Air Force Regiment which is basically the Air Force, British Air Force Army. Well, I used to go out with them. It happened to be a Scottish unit. This is a funny part. I took my guys out, we loaded up, and I had to translate for my crew for the whole thing. And because my guys couldn't, couldn't understand what they were saying, and I had to translate. And then they would laugh because I was translating for the... So it, we had some fun with those guys. We became very good like we wouldn't have to do a bigger briefings as we used to with those guys because they knew what we needed. And we worked as a multinational. I took, the Americans took me out a couple of times. Um, the only scary one, I had a new driver with me. He hadn't been outside the wire. We had to go out and I was out with the Americans. We got outside the wire about 600 meters, the main wire. 
and all the alarms went off and we all obviously had to stop. Uh, and they only had Land Rovers. So there was a light vehicle. I was in the heavy Bison, big heavy Bison and an HL behind me. So apparently I was sitting on top of it. So that was, he didn't go out driving after that. He refused. So, so we retasked him to a different job. So he was sitting on top of it? We were sitting on uh, six 105s. Oh, okay. it was, yeah, that was a little hair-raising. But we did our, what we had to do. We stopped every, the alarm. Their systems had set up, said, hey, you're sitting on something. Or somebody's sitting on something very close here. So everybody stopped. We did the, what we had to do, our jobs. We got out and secured the ground. Um, made the old heartbeat go a little bit. And I went, okay, guys. Okay, we know what we got to do. Driver, stay where you are. I stayed where I am, and so on and so forth. We did what we had to do. And the Brits say, you guys stay in your vehicles, we will clear. And they cleared our vehicle and everything. And we basically backed out. And because of that, we had to go back into camp. We backed into, into base and had to find a different route out. We had to go out a bit later to go and get that airplane, which happened to be the one that landed in the minefield. So it was... That was interesting, clearing that at night. My next question is going to be just, is there, you know, is there a specific incident or day that's more memorable for you? And can you just tell me that story? Yeah. Um, the most memorable one I can remember is that uh, we were deploying out to go and get the uh, UAV that had crashed into a, la into a minefield. Um, these aircraft had a tendency to do this. Um, my escorts were obviously the British and they were going to escort us out. We were heading out. We got about 600 meters outside the main wire and all the alarms are going off. Uh, I've got a brand new driver that had never been outside the wire. So this is his first experience outside. Uh, the rest of my crew had been out a couple of times with me, so they knew what had happened and uh, all the alarms going off. So we do what we're supposed to do. We get told to stop, so we all stop. Um, so we start doing our clearance for everything else. And then um, the, British, the, bo the boss in the British side said, we will clear the vehicles because we're not sure who's got, got something. So they clear here their vehicles and they work towards me. And it's, it's my vehicle. I'm a bison. So I'm a heavy vehicle. And behind me is the HL. The HL is obviously another heavy vehicle armored up. And they're only in Land Rovers, which is lightweight. No, no ar Their armor is basically their own body armor hanging off the side, which has always made me laugh. Um, so the alarms are going, and it's, and it's me. And um, so they're going, we've got stuff, and it's under you. So what I want you to do, they basically backed us all up, except me. <laughs> backed everyone else out of the way, so I was just say, basically sitting alone. for Not very far, they weren't far away from me, just I was still in safe bubble. Uh, their, their guys came in, did all the clearing they had to do. They said, okay, now you need to back off. So my young driver, scared, obviously he's a little bit nervous now. He, uh, okay, I said, back up. We'll go straight back the same line we came out. Um, we backed out, we got out of the area, got back into Kandahar, got cleared. We found out it was six 105s that I was sitting on top of. Um, would have been a big mess, obviously. We, I probably wouldn't be here today if that had gone off. Um, but the point was, it was close to the camp, very close to the camp, which set off a whole bunch of other uh, clearances. So we had still had to go and get this aeroplane. So we waited a few hours and we deployed back out at a different route. A little different route out. We got out to the aeroplane and that took us all night and most of the morning to get that aircraft back into base. Uh, it was pretty hair-raising. That, that was the only real hair-raising as far as I'm concerned. But uh, my young driver never went back out after that. He refused. And I f I'm fine with that, with him doing that. Um, and I would not... He'd never done, experienced anything like that for him. So, and I mean, I've spoke to him since then, after this. Uh, I've talk we've talked to it and we've had a good laugh about it. And he said, yeah, I, since then, I've been on other... He's been on other things and... He always remembers that initial one. That was his first initial shock to his system. Can you, um, I just have a couple of follow-up questions. You, you said the alarms are going off. So and that's the, basically, each convoy has a, 
a what we call the bubble. It's basically ECM for this type of stuff. The Brits have a Land Rover, that's six-wheel Land Rover, that's set up, and that's all it has, electronic countermeasure stuff, in case somebody's using a cell phone or anything else. Uh, basically, the Canadians, we had the same one. However, both systems weren't compatible. So I couldn't operate my own personal vehicle one because it wouldn't work with the British one. So I had to be under their bubbles. In other words, I'd have to be close to their vehicles. I, uh, being, having, being the Bison, I had more armour than they did. And we had, a, we had a scenario where if we came into contacts and everything else, we would, I would come forward and take up the defensive positions to protect their vehicles to come back. So but for, a, for a, let's say, a non-military audience, mm -hmm. these alarms going off, what do these alarms signify? This signifies there's a, either there's an electronic item or there's something that's uh, wired to electrical sort of circuits. It basically, from what I understand of the system, because we, we don't know much about it ourselves, um, basically it's, it senses the ground when it's driving, but it also senses the vehicles that are with it, within that, what they call the bubble. So any vehicle within that bubble, it has it located in the system. So if something like in this case, a Land Rover is a lot lighter than a 25 ton armored vehicle. As soon as I went on to it, it found, realized there's something underneath one of the vehicles. So uh, from talking to those guys, they said, basically lights come on and an alarm goes off. Basically say, you have something within very close proximity of you. And that's all really I know about that one. But I mean, it, my sense is it's not picking up the explosive, it's no. picking up perhaps the trigger. Okay. Yeah, right. potentially the trigger. So did they ever tell you that they thought someone was trying to detonate it? No, they, they said, this is what we found. I even talked to the EOD guys uh, in charge of it and they went, yeah, it's just six 105s with an electrical detonator. So in other words, there could have been potentially somebody watching us when we were leaving. And obviously, their, their system obviously worked because it picked it up and it was designed to hit for a heavier type of load. It wasn't designed for the lightweight stuff, it was designed to hit something heavy. When your driver's backing up, are you with him in the vehicle? Yep, throughout, yeah. Yeah. What'd you think? Um, had you ever had a soldier ref say, I'm, I'm never going out again? Or, I mean, was that. A a somewhat difficult situation to deal with when for me personally uh, not really because we sat down at the end of the when we got back in and he said he doesn't want to go back out we sat down as a group of the ones that were in that vehicle that night and talked about it straight away I said okay I understand you don't want to go back out however this is something you've experienced now. This is an experience that you now got to take what you've learned from that and rely on your equipment. Now you know your equipment works. You know that potentially that, yes, we could have died, but we didn't because the systems that other countries as well work with us. They work together. We work together and it worked. So you should be confident in what we have. And I mean, yes, he didn't go back out, but he was retasked to a different type of job where he didn't have to. But later on in the tour, when I talked to him about it, he went, I think I may be ready to go back out. And he apparently did go out, uh, but only a very, very close quarter, close by one. Did you have any concerns that, uh, about his attitude maybe being contagious, other people refusing? That's the reason I put them together. Every, every one of us were together. Everyone that was involved with it, we talked about it. And I said, look, you can definitely talk about it. Definitely talk about it. The reason I say talk about it, because it gets it out of your system and you understand it more. If you, the second you bottle it up, that's when you start worrying about it. Continually, your mind starts thinking about the ifs, ifs, ifs. But if you talk about it and you go, understand what happened, understand why it happened, then you're, you think, okay, I understand what's going on now. I know the reasons. And we all discussed it within the flight as well. 
the Padre to actually come down and talk to myself and all the crew on a bit later on down the line. What, what effect did it have on you? Me personally, personally, uh, understanding the scenario that bombs helped. I knew that what the potential could have happened. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I would have left my family. I would have gone. But I knew my family was set. I personally, myself, okay, I've come to do a job. This is one of the risks that I have taken. And that's me. That's just for me personally. Um, some of the other people dealt with it differently. I dealt with it doing my job. This is part of my job. Yes, this is the risk I've, I have to take to achieve what we're trying to achieve here. Um, is there another incident that sticks in your, in your mind? Um, you know, good or bad? Um, three, about halfway through the tour, um, we had an inc we had a, we had a spate of aircraft not taken off properly and they're looking for somebody to blame. And, uh, being my CEO at the time from triple Squ four squadron, he was they decided to do an inquiry why the aircraft kept having issues, not taking off properly. And they tried to push the blame to the launchers. But I, in my own, I knew my launchers were in good shape. I had literally, we literally had to rebuild most of them. We literally became mechanics on our own equipment because we didn't have the expertise on the ground. So they sent an inquiry team in. I felt insulted more than anything else. And... Um, the inquiry team came and they said, oh, blah, 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 blah. Um, we had an incident where one of the aircraft, because the aircraft dips before it takes off, and we didn't know the Americans were outside working, excavating more space for the camp. And we, the excavator was working and it lifted its arm at the second the aircraft dipped and the aircraft went up in flames. Obviously exploded because it's full of fuel. They tried to push the plane towards the launching crews. Being aggressive, and said, no, that's not my crew's fault. I stood up for all my guys and all the other guys. And it felt like they were trying to find escape coats. And I went, no, I, I wasn't going to have it. And it was a little, that was my bitter day of that. You know I mean, but I was exonerated. We were all exonerated. It was just one of those things, heat, conditions. We didn't know the Americans were out there working, for one, which... Everybody knows there's a load flight zone, and this was new group that came in and just started working, and didn't know about us launching every hour of the day. So at that point, uh, the commander at the time said, "Okay, UAVs, we're moving you." So they moved us further away from everybody. So we ended up being pushed right. We had, I ended up having to organize build of a new camp. We had a new location where we were going to move to, so they had to accelerate the construction of that. Out there, we had no security. We were the security, so we had to be our own little element. There was no towers or anything to oversee us, so basically we were pretty vulnerable out in that corner on our own. So, but we redesigned the whole, they redesigned the whole camps to allow us better range on the aircrafts. And that's when we received the Americans as well. So we had two complete UAV systems in there with the Americans. What'd you do for your HLTA? My HLTA, I could have gone anywhere in the world, and the wife said, we're going to Disney. <laughs> I went, you could have gone anywhere in the world, and we could have got something, had some, she went, nope, the kids want to go to Disney. I went, okay, Disney, Florida it is. So as it worked out, an old British Army friend has a condo in Florida, and he happened to be coming across at the same time my HLTA was on. So it ended up being perfect in that respect. Uh, got, hadn't seen him in a few years, so you know, I mean, we got to meet up with his family, which a very good family, and uh, I ended up leaving my kids with him. Me and the wife went on a three-day cruise on our own, so it worked out pretty good. Getting to Florida was a task and a half. Out of Kandahar, obviously, I flew into Dubai. Uh, out of Dubai, I flew to New York, 15-hour flight. I get to New York, and uh, um, with uh, Delta Airlines, I think it was at the time. They cancelled the flight, but didn't tell nobody. 
And I said, look, I'm just getting out of tour. I need to get to here to meet my family at midnight. They're arriving. Um, they ended up doing an amazing thing for me. They went, hang on. They called their bosses. They moved me, got me in a limo, got me from JFK to LaGuardia, got me on the next flight to Atlanta, Atlanta into it, and I still arrived before my wife, but first class. They basically paid for everything, paid for a hotel for that extra, and paid, gave us um, some other stuff as well for the family as a way of an apology more than anything else. And I was like, okay, thank you. And then came back, I still had first class coming back. What was it like going back after you leave, saying goodbye to your family and then heading back to Afghanistan? I was one of the last people going on HLTA. I, I did 90% of my tour by then. So I knew I would be on the rundown a little bit. So it wasn't so bad. For the guys at the very beginning who did the HTL very beginning, it must have been a little bit harder because they had a full tour left to do. Um, but that was just the luck of the drawer. And I said, I, I don't mind. I'll go at the very end. I don't care. Um, going back in, it was getting back used to the heat after relaxing and your mind being sort of shut down to switch it back on. That was a, sometimes a task. So you went, okay, okay, that's what I gotta get done here. That's my job. It was, then then get back to the dust and dirt and living in, in that type of an environment. And you're still living in tents at this time? Yep, yeah. we're still in the tents. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious, I've never asked anybody, how did you decide in, in your unit, HLTA dates? Uh, it was the BC. Basically, got in with, with our group, because we we're such a small, we were a fairly small group, he basically said, right, guys, these are the dates that we got. Everybody will be taking certain periods. And it was right through the whole tour, so it spread right through to alleviate a lot of the stress for everybody, so everybody's not working 30 hours a day. You know what I mean? It's, it's this is how we're going to do it. Only one or two, like two or three people at a time, just to make sure we had enough bodies at all time to do the jobs. And basically, everyone put in what they wanted or would like. And I was like, I'll take the end. I didn't really mind. And me and the wife said, yep, you just let me know and we'll organize it around that. Oh, and then the, it went to the Sergeant Major and the Sergeant Major and the, the bar, uh, CO sat down and they went, okay, that works. And everyone's, then it was posted. This is when you're getting. You were basically told when you were getting your HLTA. And then after that, it was, you went to the uh, people that help you, basically the, the resource centers, and they did 99% of the job for you. They did the research for you for the trip. This is where, this is how we can do it. This is how much it's gonna cost you. It was good in that respect. They were very helpful. And the military picks up a portion, right? Yeah, yeah, we got given a certain amount and then we paid the rest. And I mean, it pays for, Basically, they paid for my wife and my son's flights from here down to Florida and a little bit extra for the cruise. Actually, it paid for the cruise, funny enough. It was only a three-day cruise, but, but still, that was just, that was nice to be able to, my friend saying, yeah, you two go away. We've got your kids for three days. Go. So we literally, I dropped them off at uh, Nasser and uh, we jumped on the cruise ship and off we went for three days to Baja. So that was good. The, um, at the end of it all, uh, before you go home, but ultimately how, how satisfying was, was the tour for you? Um, overall, good, because I learned a lot of new things. I mean, learning the UAV system was like, wow, this is completely different to what I'm used to doing. So it's like a 180 on me. Uh, it's be like, like being an infantryman, then you're now a technician. And that's the sort of extreme, from one extreme to another. You're learning, you learned about what's involved in to re repair these aircraft. Because all the guys, the mechanics that we had, there's only like one or two, you know what I mean, five guys, they needed help just doing the basic stuff. So anyone that was interested, they taught us. I learned how to carbon fiber, how that works and how to repair airplane wings and hydraulics. I'm a mechanic by trade, so the engine part was easy part for me. But I mean, a lot of the guys were like learning different types of things that they normally wouldn't touch. It was a challenge. Yes, the job was a challenge. The job itself was a challenge.
because it's all new. It was all new for us. We hadn't touched this type of stuff before. I believe that. I mean, that systems, those systems nowadays are potentially life-saving because we could see stuff that the guys couldn't see on the ground. We could have a look and say, hey, there's something here for you to look at. So technology, yeah, definitely is the way to go on that stuff. Tell me a bit about um, sort of coming home, but not, tell me about Cyprus and decompression. Um, when they decided what time, because I was one of the last, one of the last to, to leave, I got extended a little bit because uh, my counterpart that was coming in ended up, they didn't have one. So I ended up sort of double hatting for a little bit. Um, when I did go off to decompression in Cyprus, um, we arrived, it's fairly late at night, you know, I mean, you're pretty exhausted. And the hardest, I think the thing, once we got our briefings out, there was more briefings, as just to talk about decompression, what you'd like to do. It was just like, okay, I'm looking for my pistol. And things like that going, I don't need to worry about this now. And that was something that was going through my mind of going, I don't need the rifle. It's not, I don't need it at the moment. Um, I went and visit, because I've been to Cyprus before on a tour with the British Army. So I went back to where I did my, some training. So that was part of my decompression going, oh, I remember this. Um, some of the guys, yes, uh, we did have one or two drinks, obviously. We, did, we tried to vent out. Um, and then some guys just did the tour. I mean, it's an opportunity to see some, a different culture again. And it was like, and a lot of the guys who went with me, uh, I think two guys actually came back on HLTA with me. Um, we went off and did some visiting of different things. How useful was it, do you think? HLTA, it's good because you stop thinking about the gun. No, you said HLTA, but... Oh, oh the other, sorry, my part. Sorry, yeah. How, Decompression, how, sorry. Yeah, so how, how useful was that? Very useful because it gets your mind unlocked from the tasks. Because everything you do on, in an operation is tasked. So you know, okay, I have to have this done, this, this, this done. This allows your mind to relax. Try and relax because it's been at high tempo for so long. I find it very useful because it, you can, your body relaxes, your mind starts relaxing, and you feel more comfortable. And it allows you, when you start coming back in home, start the trip home, go, okay, now I'm ready to come home. I'm ready, I've done what I had to do, I've done my job, it's now time for me to come home. Some guys had a harder time doing it, uh, but others, you know what I mean, they took the time, did what they had, had to do and just relaxed. Tell me about the, the specifics of how you came home, like how you were received. Um, mine was a bit of a disaster, a little bit of a disaster. So this is, uh, we're, we're taken off from Cyprus. Um, we were attached with the French group that was coming back into Montreal. So loaded up on the Airbus, which is the, um, uh, the Airbuses. And we uh, flew into Montreal. And they offloaded everybody's gear. And that's where we did our customs. We did all, and the rest of us that were flying on had to fly on to Winnipeg. So we basically got off, did all our custom stuff, all our gear was off. And so we get straight back on the plane. And there's only about 40 of us less, 40 left of us on board of a full Airbus. And I'm looking outside the window and going, there's a whole bunch of kit out there on the runway. And the aircraft is being pushed out. I'm going, I don't think that, I think that might be some of our own stuff. I went, uh-oh. So my mind's already going, oh, it's probably mine. Thinking, laughing, oh, yeah, whatever, it's probably my kit. We get into Winnipeg quite late at night, very late at night, and I've got mostly reservists left on board and a, a big bunch of regular force guys from Shiloh. Uh, so we get told, okay, getting off the plane here, get your kit. I'm going, uh-oh, where's my kit? And that's when I report. I said, I saw kit still on the runway in Montreal. What do you mean? I says, when we pushed out, I saw a cart full of kits still on the air, on, the, on a cart when we pushed out. And my kit's not here. None of my kit's here. So basically all I've got is my day pack and what I was carrying inside the aircraft. 
The rest of my gear is not non-existent. We were told that we were going to be put up in accommodations for the night in Winnipeg. I went, fine. Next thing I know, we're all on a bus. Everybody's on a bus. And we're being bussed out to Shiloh, which is a two-hour trip from Winnipeg. It's a, it's a haul. So, and we're all exhausted. It's time zones and everything else. And it's, you know what I mean, middle of the night. We arrive in Shiloh at the uh, gym there, big gym. And everybody's off loan, everybody's meeting their families. I'm stood, stood there going, okay, obviously there must be a mix up or something. They must be gonna put us up here instead. And uh, so waiting, people disappearing, disappearing, disappearing. And then I'm looking around, I'm going, are you a reservist? Yes, get over there. You a reservist? Yeah, get over there. I ended up with 10 reservists from all over the country. We were all basically, everyone had gone. I'm going, okay. So one of the, the RSM of the PPCLI happened to be there. He said, what are you guys doing here? I went, we were dumped here. And he went, didn't have an answer. By this, now I'm getting a little angry. My uh, temperatures, we've been traveling all night. We're tired, we're exhausted. We have no accommodation. We have nowhere to, he says, you can crash out on the gym floor. That's when I lost it <laughs> uh, on him. And I did apologize later and, but I lost it. Being the senior guy, being the senior guy on the ground, I took the responsibility of to look after the rest of the troop. I had 10 guys, we needed accommodations. So the RSM and me went and got accommodation. We ended up being put in the officer's mess because that was the only place they could find. So, and he made some calls. Somebody decided to move to Shire, but didn't tell anybody. So they had to bring everybody that was in Winnipeg to clear us reservists out all the way to Shiloh the next morning. So we had to be up at 6 a.m. This is like three o'clock in the morning. So we're getting about three hours sleep. That's all we're going about to get. And so I went, okay. They come in, they start clearing us and says, okay, you guys, here's your flights and everything else to get, to get home. So I had guys from Vancouver, some from Edmonton, myself coming into Lethbridge. By the time I would have reached my flight. I was the last one flying out, very last person to fly out. Now I says, okay, I need transport. Oh, there's no transport, it's up to you guys. We were like shunned off and I was, that was not, that was my, that was my breaking point at this point. I, that was enough. Uh, when they said that, I decided, okay, I called the limo company. I ordered six, four limos and four limos to back to Winnipeg to the airport. And I made sure every single person had their own receipt for the whole trip for that. So got everybody on the flight. I got my flight and they went, oh, you're not going to make your Lethbridge flight. You'll have to stay in Calgary one night. I went, that ain't happening. I'm going to go rent a car. Uh, I get to Calgary and actually Colonel Beauchamp, he was the BC at the time. His wife met me, was the first person to meet me, at the, the person that met me at the airport in Calgary because I was the only one coming into Calgary. I survived the hotel without a scratch. She's got a diamond ring on. She cuts my face and I'm bleeding everywhere. And it looks really good on my desert tan uniform. So I'm bleeding everywhere. Uh, so I said, now that's a standard joke between me and her. I said, I'm not going close to you because you're going to end up making me bleed. So, but one of the guys had heard that I was flying in and hadn't got a flight. So he jumped in his own car, come up to Karen and got me from and um, because it was a Wednesday, I arrived on a Wednesday, a weird day. Um, so he drove up to Calgary on his own dime and everything else and picked me up and brought me home down here. And then I told the family, okay, I'll be here in Lethbridge at this time. So they met up with me then. So. So we've talked a bit about your anger, but uh, um, what was it like to, once you're back with your family? What, what's it like making that transition now from mission to um, during the tour, I didn't realize I injured myself as well. That was the thing. I fell down. One of the things happened on tour, which I never even thought about until, until I got actually started calming down from the tour, from the adrenaline. I ended up blowing out my shoulder. I didn't know it. Uh, I ended up, I had to end up having two surgeries on my shoulder to fix it. Um, the system really helped in that respect. They went, you've been hurt. 
you need to be fixed before we can let you go. So I ended up having two surgeries, major surgeries on my shoulder to fix it. Um, fully fit now, so it's been good. But transition back to f civilian life, it was a bit of a challenge to start with for a few days. Like I'd always be looking for my pistol or I would be restless at about three, four o'clock in the morning. And then it took time. It took a few weeks till my mind went, okay, I'm home now. I don't need to work. Um, I did get upset with somebody in Burger King one day. Um, she was complaining about not having a pickle or something. Um, I'd being just back, I was like, I'm still in uniform, in desert tan uniform, and I'm going, there's people that are worse off in you, and you're complaining about a pickle. Let's get on with this. And sitting back and thinking about it a lot of time and go, why did I do that? There's no re rhyme or reason why I did that. It's just, it's like, that upset me, the pickle upset me. Why did that upset me? It, I mean, it was, she was talking down to a young kid who's trying to do his job. And that's not right. It wasn't right in my eyes, so. How did she react? She was rather shocked, and then she saw I was in uniform and didn't say nothing and walked away. It was like somebody was actually complaining to her, say, why are you complaining? She probably never had it before. Somebody was actually saying, why are you complaining? Any other sort of um, stuff like that? Sort of just in terms of your emotions or um, Once in a while, I found that I like driving. People would be, like I'd be doing convoy driving. I didn't realize I was doing it. Um, I'd be driving myself and I'd be sitting close up to vehicles that I wouldn't normally would do. Or I'd be watching things that, looking at intersections a lot longer than I would normally. Just little, it was just little things a lot of time. But as time obviously goes on, you just get back into the normal routine of your life. Um, I took over the position of the QM here. I went back to my civilian job and tried that for a few months, but I could never flick back into it right away. I mean, it, was a, it is a high stress job, it, plain and simple. That job is a very high stress. You've got corporate people, you, you've got all the corporation that needs answers and it's just like being in the army sometimes. Um, and that's how I did so well in that job because I used to departmental like we do in the military. But I just couldn't get back in with that swing. I just could not do it. So I, I looked for a class B and ended up doing, they said, oh, we need somebody to sort out the QM. I went, okay, I'll try it for a year or so, see, just to see if I can do it slowly come back into it slowly. Um, yeah, it ended up, ended, up doing, ended up being five years doing the QM. Obviously my injuries was part of the reason that they said, this is part of your rehab, work, return to work for me. How did you wreck your shoulder? To be honest, I honestly don't know. <laughs> I think it's from one of them, when we were doing some work on one of the launchers, it jarred and ripped. And because you, I didn't notice it, and when I came, when, just before I came, when I was coming down, because when we were starting to pack up, uh, I started losing finger feeling in my fingers, and I was like, somebody, one of the guys was said, you better go and see, get them, check it out. Just, just in case, you'd never know what you've done. And then within a week, I had n no movement in the arm. I couldn't move the arm. The arm was like, as if it was non-existent. So while I was still in theory, actually, they figured it out in theory, so they gave me acupuncture to get me back here so they could fix it up. That's when they said, you tore it good. What the hell did you do? I went, I honestly don't know. I, I, I did fall down one time. I could have just banged it just, just that right, or I lifted something wrong. Because some of the stuff, equipment on the launchers wasn't light items. They are fairly heavy items and you take four of you to lift it. So it's just one of those weird ones. It's like, hmm, okay. Uh, I, I just have one or two more questions for you. But I'm just curious, um, any, can you draw any comparisons between your um, deployments with the British Army and this one with the Canadian military in terms of? Uh, I think I was more prepared than most of the young guys would have been because I, I've been through a desert before. I've been through seeing how people from other groups have treated other people. So my mindset was a little bit different. Um, 12 years in the military with the British Army, I did quite a few tours. 
uh, as said, Northern Ireland I've done. I did uh, Gulf One and I did a couple other tours. I did Yugoslavia when it physically was happening as UN. So I've seen some things that some guys should never have, any person should have to see. Uh, I think it, Afghanistan for me was, uh, it was a pinnacle for me in the respect that I needed, needed to do it myself, just to say, yes, you know what, how to deal with it. And now maybe you can pass your knowledge to some of the younger guys, say, hey, look, this is one way of dealing with it. Maybe it'll help, maybe it'll not, but it will give them an idea of what's happening. What about just um, the two different militaries, like the British way um, doing things in the Canadian way? And that was the nice thing, funny thing about it. That's the reason I had to translate a lot of time for my guys. The way their jargon and obviously the language sometimes, they were Scottish. So this was, when they start speaking and they get fat and excited, they start speaking fast. Uh, our guys were going, what the hell are they talking about? Um, <laughs> and I'd have to translate, say, okay, this is what they're saying on the radios. Their radio net was pretty fast. And my ear was slightly more tuned to what our guys were naming. By the time we we're halfway through tour, my guys would be, understand everything these guys could say. And we'd work together quite often. Um, one exercise that I had to build for the CO, because um, we replaced COs halfway through tour, because uh, Triple Four Squadron's CO was in charge of the SAR Squadron, so he needed to get back for that. So they bring another, they brought another major in. And he said, I need you to run an exercise to move this whole place to a farther distance. So I talked to the engineers, I set up stuff for the engineers, so I did a whole scenario where we're moved, we've been all sorts of scenarios, potential things that could go wrong. We had basically a potential bad scenario of everything going wrong on this whole move. So I ran the exercise for that. Um, had the young captains, they're all fairly young captains, pilots and stuff, take command of this stuff and run, run through us like, you're now the commander of this vehicle. What do you want us to do, sort of thing and run them through scenarios where an IED went off. Now what do we do? So actually it was, and it was, it was very good, well received by the British because they, they said, this is actually a good way to do it. And we actually did within the compounds of the camp. So we were using the whole camp basically as our convoy mm -hmm. uh, to move this whole flight system, which ended up being not feasible because of the type of equipment that it is, it's sensitive. So rough terrain wasn't conducive to it being road moved. So it'd be helied in. It's more sensible to heli it in, safer. How do you think, uh, like my last question is just, how do you think this experience uh, changed or affected you as a person, as a soldier? Um, as a person itself, I mean, it opened my eyes to some other stuff uh, in respect that uh, I saw some of our successes, and I saw some of our non-successes. So success, oh, sorry, excuse me. Yeah, success. So how, how did it change or affect you? Uh, in respect, I know where I'm gonna go to now. I'm at a certain level in my career now. I've, my career is now gonna be coming on a wind down. I'm at that stage. I've now gotta pass the knowledge I've learned over the years to the younger guys, start pushing it to the younger guys. Say, hey, this may happen. This may happen. This is what you need to do. Um, I took over recruiting specifically because the next generation is coming in behind. So I need to, we need to make sure we have the recruits. We need to know the challenge for recruiting is a challenge, plain and simple. It is a challenge for us. We have to find the right people to do the job. I mean, it is a challenge in life. It is something that some people can do, may want to try, and don't realize they can do it. It's, my job is now is to find those people, pass my knowledge across to the younger leadership, and hopefully they'll take some of what I teach them and use it properly. Is there anything that I, I haven't asked you about that you want to finish by saying? No, I mean, my career with the Canadian Forces so far, been phenomenal, like definitely a different way from what I was taught at the beginning. 
However, I've adapted with what I've learned from two different armies and used those skills together. Uh, obviously, there's always going to be challenges with whatever we're going to be doing. Uh, overall, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be doing it after 30 plus years if I didn't enjoy it. I'm still enjoying what I do. And I believe in what we do a lot of time. Thank you very much. Thank you.